Hello and welcome to your first lecture on the 1980s. I've got here a list of some of the main concepts that I want you to take away from looking at the development of uh, contemporary art in the 1980s. So let's see, um, I'm just going to run through these real quick. Postmodernism is a general term for a kind of shift in attitude that we see um, in the art world uh, among artists. It really emerges uh, strongly in the 1980s. Uh, Postmodernism just refers to this kind of after modernism. Now, modernism in the world of art has a particular meaning. That is, um, it's a condition or a kind of general approach to art that emerges in the late 19th, early 20th century that is concerned with abstraction and formal questions about the making of art itself. Um, modernism manifests itself in movements like in the period we've been studying, abstract expressionism or minimalism, this era in which artists are creating works of art that are meant to be non-historical, non-referential, abstract, concerned with the creation of art itself. Um, in the postmodern period, artists move away from that very sort of pristine formalism to um, become more engaged with the art of the past. Um, Postmodernist art tends to be more playful, um, <clears throat> can be very serious or it can be very jokey. Uh, it's much more engaged in, um, in generating meanings outside of just the work itself. And um, you've got some readings on postmodernism to do, and you'll see this as we look at artists in this period, how you can see the shift from this modernist formalism to a postmodern approach to making art. Um, and that's a very important concept. It's still really in play in the 2000s, this idea, the postmodern approach to making art. Um, another thing that becomes really important in the 1980s is questioning the gallery and museum system. Now, we've seen some of this before with early performance artists like Chris Burton, who says, you know, um, who, who does works of art that are meant to challenge the whole idea of the hierarchy of the gallery and this space that, you know, you're not supposed to violate by interrupting a performance work of art, things like that. In the 1980s, we'll see even more kind of explicit challenges to this idea that galleries and museums are the place where art is supposed to happen. Uh, corollary to that is this interest in the 1980s, as you know from reading about Jean-Michel Basquiat, in um, the idea of the outsider artist. Now, uh, there are two tracks really in the 1980s to becoming a famous artist. One is the MFA approach. If you get an MFA at a famous school like Yale, that's one way to become known as an artist and get yourself into the gallery and museum system. Another way that becomes prominent in the 80s, and again, you know this from reading about Jean-Michel, is this interest in artists who don't come from within that formal training system. Now, again, we've seen interest in the outsider before. I mean, if you think back to um, Dubuffet in the immediate post-World War II period, who is interested in the art of children and the insane and of what so-called primitive cultures, because the idea being that these are people who haven't been corrupted by too much formal training. They are um, pure, right? Their, their artistic expression is unmediated by the, these filters that you learn when you go to art school. And that's something that in the 1980s will um, shift focus to really graffiti artists. Basquiat gets his name as a graffiti artist. Also, um, Keith Haring, who we'll look at this in the next couple of lectures. Uh, and and they, are, they are only two of many who kind of come from outside the regular system, and that becomes a big issue in the 80s. Two styles or isms that we will look at today, neo-expressionism and neo-dada, these are two um, sort of working or ways of working and styles that we see emergent in the 80s that go along with all of this stuff. Um, now, this last thing that I have here, Greed is Good, is a quote from a 1980s movie, an iconic movie called Wall Street, starring Michael Douglas and directed by Oliver Stone. Um, Douglas plays this Wall Street trader, you know, this kind of ep epitome of the 
1980s yuppie baby boomer making tons and tons of money, um, working as a professional. Um, the 80s were a really kind of weird time socially and economically. Coming out of the 1970s where you have this concern with identity and with civil rights and with um, identity politics and also the 1970s more broadly speaking was an era in which you had a great deal of um, turmoil. Uh, the, the 70s start out with we're still embroiled in a war in Vietnam uh, then you have Richard Nixon um, and his shenanigans being forced to resign from office in uh, what 74 um, you have uh, the Carter administration you have um, which is which is plagued by problems with um, a, a crisis in the oil markets there's a re recession in the 1970s lots and lots of the jobs that people had depended on since the 1950s just start to evaporate as we see um, you know changes in the auto industry in the steel industry um, by the end of the 1970s things are things are um, People are cynical, I would say. You know, people have given up on some of the idealism they had in the 60s and the 70s. And that generation that was responsible for the, the free love of the 60s and whatnot in the 1970s, the baby boom generation, has settled into adulthood and has decided to give up on the whole, um, you know, pursuing a, a better world. And they go to, um, they go to, um, turn to sort of you know making money and um, and um, to to hell with their former idealism. So the 1980s is this kind of interesting time where uh, with the inauguration of Ronald Reagan in 80 you have um, or 81 I guess you have a, a kind of conservative ascendancy. You have a turn away from social interests. You have a more um, uh, money-oriented kind of culture. Uh, you know a less I would say a less serious, a less earnest culture in the 1980s. And that is something that I'm saying more generally, but it also has some implications for the art world. One of the things that's very distinctive about the art world of the 1980s is this is one of the first times we see art being treated like a speculative commodity the way that people treat barrels of oil or corn futures on um, the trading markets, okay? So people buy works of art with the idea that they're going to increase in value and um, so one of the things we ha that we see happening with c contemporary artists of the period is people are collectors are out looking for the next hot thing because if they can buy these guys and some girls but mostly guys if they can buy them while they're uh, still relatively unknown and then they break big in the art market then they can make a ton of money. It's also when we start to see record-breaking prices being paid for works of art, uh, classic works of art. It's in the 1980s that you have a Japanese businessman paying uh, I think it was it was a record-setting price at the time. It was about 30 or 40 million dollars for a Van Gogh painting. Um, and that was, you know, shocking at the time, but now, of course, that record has even been broken. So people pay astronomical sums of money for art, starting really in the 1980s. This is when we see this shift in the market to be treating art as really a speculative commodity. And that is something that will, of course, affect the way that art develops during this time period. Now, um, probably really exemplifying these trends is one artist who has a very short and, and fast career, Jean-Michel Basquiat. As you can see, died really relatively young at the end of the 1980s of a heroin overdose. So from 60, 1960 to 1988, and that's a photograph of him there. Jean-Michel Basquiat came to prominence far, first as a graffiti artist. Uh, he started tagging buildings around town in the area of New York City that was kind of an up-and-coming art um, neighborhood and it got him attention. You know, he, he would spray paint these rather uh, rather enigmatic kinds of uh, slogans on the walls uh, outside on slum buildings around Lower Manhattan. Uh, Samo, S A S A M O. They start. He starts spray painting this graffito, graffiti. So here are some of the phrases. And actually, I've got linked in Blackboard film from downtown 81 of him tagging buildings. Samo as an escape clause. Samo as an end to playing art. Samo. Um, 
Plush safe he think, same-o. Same-o is an end to mind wash religion, nowhere politics, and bogus philosophy. So there are these kind of weird, you know, little challenges to the art world, and they get attention. And that is really what gets his, his name made. I mean, you have to think, this is a time when... Um, hip hop is really like a brand new musical form uh, that's breaking on the scene. Um, early graffiti artists, early rap artists who sometimes are the same, um, early DJs, you know, like uh, Fab Five Freddy. These are people who are just, they're like brand new, they're young, you know, they're what, 19, 20 years old in 1980. I mean, these are young kids who are out there. Um, uh, and they're not part of the gallery scene. They're not part of the art world, per se. They're folks who are um, perceived as being more sort of edgy and streetwise, and they have this real outsider appeal to the, um, gallery, to, to the, the gallery world. So here's Basquiat in the late 70s or early 80s tagging a building, um, and that is sort of typical of Samo... Um, of a Samo slogan and the look of his uh, the look of his graffiti, and here's an, another couple of pieces of his graffiti. Um, they're no longer extant. I mean, all this stuff has disappeared. Um, but I mean, this is you know photographs taken early on of uh, Samo. And here's an example of Basquiat's painting. So he's working also as a painter. Um, at the same time that he's out kind of generating buzz by doing this tagging of buildings. He becomes um, the darling of an up-and-coming gallery director named Mary Boone, and it's because she recognizes that there's some real potential here for um, collectors to, to like this guy and buy, buy this guy, and it's also because he becomes friends with Andy Warhol that uh, in 1982 that he's becoming um, th that he becomes kind of you know moved from the uh, margins to the center so I just want to point out here a couple of things about his his um, paintings Basquiat's paintings tend to be very large scale which we know from abstract expressionism that's a sort of classic you know painterly maneuver uh, the style of painting that he does gets the nickname neo expressionism in fact partly for the fact that he paints these large canvases partly for the fact that as you can see here they are very reminiscent of abstract expressionism in that they have large um, canvases very s sketchily or um, sort of um, um, expressively applied paint. Uh, in the case of Basquiat, a little bit like early paintings by Jackson Pollock, you have these rather iconic looking figures placed in the paintings. Uh, Basquiat appeals to these collect or appeals to people in the early 80s too because he his paintings look like graffiti. His paintings look like they could have been uh, or, you know, look like they're childlike. Uh, they have that kind of outsider quality, that untrained quality that people really like. Now, there's a, a conundrum here because, of course, Basquiat is deliberately painting in this style. He does have training as an artist. He, in fact, had gone to a private school in, uh, in New York City. He had grown up um, in New York. He was, uh, and, and, he, so he had some background. He knew what he was doing. This stuff was not all just created by accident. Um, but the story that was developed around Basquiat is one of this kind of outsider wild child, you know? And in fact, people were obsessed with the idea that he was black, which he was, and that he, his father was from Haiti. And so, um, you know, there's this famous scene from an interview where somebody asks him, you know, do the colors of your paintings come from growing up, you know, with Haitian art? And Basquiat's like, you know, I'm an American. I grew up here in New York City. Just because my dad came from Haiti doesn't mean that we had a bunch of, you know, voodoo flags around our house. Uh, and he was very frustrated by this, always attempts to label him and pigeonhole him as being black, you know, black artist. So what does it mean to be a black artist? Uh, and he would say, you know, I'm an artist. Can you talk about me as an artist? Um, so, which is, of course, also very different than the um, Afro-Cobra artists of the previous generation who were very concerned with this idea of pan-Africanism. Here, Basquiat just wants to be e expressing himself. Um, so let's take a look just at a few more of his paintings. Uh, and I'm sorry, I don't have the title of this one here, but I just wanted to show you a couple so you'd get a sense of what Basquiat's work looked like. Uh, I should tell you, by the way, that the speculation in Basquiat's paintings, I mentioned that the art market of the 80s was very much about, you know, investing for a return. 
Um, Basquiat died in 88 of a drug overdose and immediately the prices of his paintings went up. By, the by 2007, the record for a piece of work by, uh, by Basquiat was, um, let's see, from May 2007, so not quite a year ago. An untitled Basquiat painting from 1981 sold at Sotheby's for $14.6 million. The previous record was um, a 2002 sale of a painting actually owned by one of Metallica's members that was sold for uh, $5.5 million. So from 2002 to 2007, his paintings have uh, tripled in value, basically, nearly tripled in value. So again, I mean, this the art market continues to be a kind of speculative marketplace. Um, for works like this and because he died young and because he had this persona that we think of when we think of the artist he was tortured you know he had a kind of um, tumultuous relationships with women and tumultuous relationships with his gallery owners uh, you know he was an, uh, a, a kind of um, bad boy wild child you know and and of course the drug use and all of that gets glamorized i think a little bit and he got treated as this kind of you know he lived fast died young left a good looking corpse and so then since there's a limited rate a limited number of his paintings out there because of his early death then they are you know worth even that much more it's a little bit gruesome really so let's see, here's another one of his paintings, Luna Park from 1982. And again, Neo-Expressionism, I just wanted you to see this large st scale painting, um, very expressively brushily applied paint. In this case, you have um, very, I would say, deliberately childlike looking drawings and graffiti being placed on the painting. One thing that really separates the neo-expressionists from the abstract expressionists is the inclusion of figures, the inclusion of words, as you can see, um, the inclusion of implied narratives and stories in these um, paintings. Another thing that we'll see with another uh, neo-expressionist we look at is the inclusion of historical references. This is what characterizes postmodern art as opposed to modern art. The abstract expressionists would be classified as modernists since they're very interested in formal qualities of painting and the idea of the work of art as a complete entity into and of itself, whereas these postmodern artists are not so concerned with that. They make references to the outside world. They draw connections. They draw on history. They are sometimes funny and playful and sometimes serious, but always having more content and meaning outside just the painting itself. Here, and for example, here in his Horn Players from 1983, not only do you have words included on here, but you also have, he's referencing um, Charlie Parker, who's known as the bird, that's what ornithology is, uh, Charlie Parker's famous famous um, um, album. And you've got, let's see, Dizzy Gillespie referenced here. You've obviously got uh, words, you've got music, you've got musical symbols. So this is a painting about more than just a painting itself. And of course, it is that expressionist style, that neo-expressionist style with figurative imagery, with words, with references to the outside, with the kind of graffiti, and then this very deliberately childlike looking drawing. And here again, Hollywood Africans. Here in 1983, he's dealing with questions of representation uh, and the representation of, of um, blacks in the movies. So again, uh, it's it's an interesting shift from the modernist period to the postmodernist period. And in this case, of course, Basquiat has really engaged in the sort of identity questions that we also saw with the black arts movement. Uh, another way that Basquiat really becomes known and famous and becomes part of the inner circle of the art world is that he strikes up a friendship with Andy Warhol in 1982. And then they... they embarked on a series of collaborations in the 80s. And this is one of their collaborations where it starts out with Andy doing an oil painting of the Paramount logo, and then Basquiat comes in and overpaints on top of that with his own style. Uh, they did a series of these kinds of paintings. And in fact, you know, Warhol came under some criticism. Some people felt that this was very opportunistic on Warhol's part, you know, that he saw that this guy, this kid was the hot new young commodity, and Warhol was becoming sort of less less cutting edge and so he you know invites Basquiat into his world so that he can feed off of his creative energy that's one interpretation I'll just say I mean you know there is a certain 
cynical feeling to the art world of the 1980s. And in fact, um, there's a really great movie about him, about Basquiat, called just Basquiat, directed by uh, Julian Schnabel, who was actually a fellow neo-expressionist painter in the 80s. He's gone on to become a quite prominent movie director, most recently did uh, D Diving Bell and the Butterfly. Uh, I highly recommend it if you're interested in this artist and in this period. It's a very thoughtful and very well-done movie about the rise of um, Jean-Michel Basquiat, his relationship to his gallery owners, uh, gallery directors, and uh, his relationship to Warhol. At any rate, so there's, you know, Warhol already kind of part of the celebrity world, um, glomming onto Basquiat's energy and his up-and-coming celebrityhood. Uh, here's another example, then of Basquiat arm and hammer and Warhol arm and hammer where again it starts with Warhol painting and then Basquiat comes in and overpaints it with his own style. This by the way is the painting that sold for 14 million dollars uh, in May of last year so just FYI so it's another example of the, and you can see it is large scale like abstract expressionism but it is this neo expressionist painting. Okay, I just mentioned Julian Schnabel, and I want to show you a couple of his paintings as well. Julian Schnabel becomes a friend of Basquiat's. They're coming up at the same time. This is um, his, he was also um, handled by the Mary Boone Gallery, and uh, he became, that's where he made his name. He had a show, a solo show in 1979. Then he was invited to participate in the Venice Biennale, which is a, a, a biannual show every two years in Venice. And in fact, it's still a very important show where if you get invited to the Biennale, you have made it. Uh, he, so he's making a name for himself as a neo-expressionist. And again, he's also an example of postmodernism. So Schnabel here has painted a picture that is um, a subject that had is art historical. Uh, there are lots and lots of pictures of St. Francis in ecstasy out in the, um, in the desert done throughout history. So here's um, St. Francis by Julian Schnabel. It's large scale, right? It's a huge painting. It's very brushy in the background. You can really see that thickly applied paint, the typical of the um, neo-expressionists. And here he's also included, and this is what really made his name, was this, this twist on Expressionist painting, where he has included a, to make the surface texture, the rocky texture of the, the landscape that St. Francis is in, he has included a bunch of broken crockery on the surface of the painting. These large-scale plate paintings set on, a, or with broken ceramic plates, were something new and really got a huge um, a huge response from the critical public in the 1980s. So this is really what made Schnabel's name, these large-scale broken crockery expressionist paintings. It's neo-expressionist because of the size and the, the, the surface texture and the brushiness and the, the general kind of energy of the paintings. It is postmodern because unlike a modernist painting, here you've got an art historical reference, you've got figurative imagery. Um, it is not the kind of self-enclosed hermetic world of modernism here. There's just a, um, oh, what, 16th century painting of St. Francis in Ecstasy, just as a comparison, just so that you can see it's a, it's a historical subject. It's one that goes way back in the history of Western art. He's included some of the same iconographies here. You can see there was a skull on the right-hand side of the Schnabel painting. If you go back, you can see it quite clearly, and there's the skull resting on a table in um, St. Francis's little bower there. Um, that's the, you know, in this rocky landscape, that is the sort of iconography of this image, or of this, this story that um, Schnabel's referencing. Here's another example of Schnabel's early kind of um, neo-expressionist painting. This is his Exile from 1980, where he's literally quoting from a Caravaggio painting, which I'm showing you there is the inset on the right-hand side, that he's put into this very large-scale painting that has something in common with, you know, abstract expressionism in the very brushy, very thickly applied paint, very expressionistic looking, and then you've got these large areas of just um, abstract applications of color. But unlike a modernist painting here, you also have historical references, figures, you also have this kind of random looking doll that's been incorporated into the um, painting, you know, a, a little um, 
um, pop culture kind of image that never would have been part of uh, an abstract expressionist work. And then here he also seems to be taking a page from the neo-dada movement uh, or the the uh, with guys like Robert Rauschenberg remember his canyon or his other combine paintings so here you've got a couple of antlers sticking out of the uh, sticking out of the surface of this painting there's another uh, Schnabel portrait or picture this is self portrait in Andy's shadow he's referring of course to Andy Warhol this is a 1987 painting of broken crockery where I mean as you can see the the materials Bondo uh, which is a substance you use to fill in um, um, cracks and, and, and scratches in a, the body of a car, right? Bondo plates and oil on a wood panels. So here it is a mix of unusual media um, as well as figurative painting and it's very uh, expressionist style, right, that's being used here. So uh, that's kind of Julian Schnabel in a, a nutshell. Uh, since then, as I mentioned, he has gone on to, and he's made millions and millions. I mean, he became one of the, the big sellers of the 1980s, became very wealthy, and kind of catapulted into the jet set, you know. Um, friends with Andy Warhol, friends with all sorts of movie stars, um, married to a supermodel. He now is a movie director, and he just recently bought a place in, in Manhattan, I uh, just wanted to show you there his uh, his building that he purchased and then he's been renovating it. He got in trouble with his neighborhood association because he painted the building this kind of hideous Pepto-Bismol pink, uh, which is obviously quite visible from wherever you are in the neighborhood, uh, but he's been able to keep it that Pepto-Bismol color. So just FYI, I think that's interesting. He's, he's a little bit of an agent provocateur. You know, he likes to irritate people a little bit, but he also, again, has kind of become since his debut as a neo-expressionist, he has become a, um, you know, celebrity, he's become a director, he's kind of gone on to do all these other things. And then, okay, so we've looked at two neo-expressionists, and I just want to show you the the preeminent neo-dadaist who emerges in the 1980s, and that is this guy, Jeff Koons, who, like Schnabel, since he um, survived the 1980s, Koons has also become uh, incredibly, he's one of the, I would say, uh, most expensive living artist. He is still working. He is um, still producing. He's still collected. Uh, he's also, his early work in the 1980s sets records for collectors to purchase them. Uh, here's one of his early, you know, groundbreaking series that he does. This is a uh, new Hoover Deluxe Shampoo Polishers from the 1980s, uh, where you can see it's three purchase shampoo polishers, plexiglass to make the case, and fluorescent lights in, interspersed between each of the, uh, the um, shampoo polishers. Now, just from this course, you should be able to recognize several influences on Jeff Koons. First of all, I hope you recognize the ideas of Marcel Duchamp with the notion of the purchased ready-made that you put into a new context and make into a work of art. I hope you also recognize, I mean, there's some secondary influence of guys like Jasper Johns, you know, with his bronze light bulb, and of course, our friend Dan Flavin, the uh, minimalist artist who worked with fluorescent lights. So there's some interesting art historical references, even of the 20th century, encased in Jeff Koons's, um, Jeff Koons's installation here. Uh, but he will con he will take this idea and then move it into directions that people hadn't gone before. For example, uh, by the mid 1980s, the NBA had become w one of the top three sports in America, uh, one of the you know most watched, most attended, um, highest grossing sports, and this is partly due to the influence of these really. Um, famous players like Magic Johnson, Larry Bird, and particularly Michael Jordan, who by the 80s, you know, they have taken professional basketball to a new level. Uh, and so here's Coons incorporating the ideas of, you know, the importance of the NBA into his, uh, or the, the prominence of the NBA and the money of the NBA into his work. So here's two ball equilibrium tank where you have a couple of regulation NBA basketball suspended in a tank of liquid. Um, 
he does this as a series in the 1980s and this is just you know his NBA stuff is just I mean incredibly it makes you know a huge splash in the art world this is a subject that hadn't really been part of the art world even with these seemingly very boundary breaking um, hierarchy breaking artists like Marcel Duchamp and uh, Jeff Koons or excuse me and um, um, Jasper Johns I mean he's taking this breakdown between art and uh, life even farther you know uh, and also of course I mean this is typically 1980s because NBA basketball has become a huge celebrity culture and has become hugely uh, money generating that he would turn to that as opposed to you know something else um, is particularly sort of typical of the 80s here's another one of his um, equilibrium tanks with a, a basketball suspended exactly in the middle he also did uh, paintings or excuse me um, works like this poster dynasty on third um, uh, Third Street from 1985. It's just a framed Nike poster that he included in his exhibition so that you have him taking low art, advertising art, and appropriating it and calling it his own. So very much part of the Neo Dada. Again, remember Dada with Marcel Duchamp and then Neo Dada starting with Johns in the, in the um, 60s, 50s and 60s. I mean, this is, this is reworking some of the ideas of found objects and chance and appropriation and the boundary between high and low that Coons is working with in the 80s. He also does things like he has a basketball bronzed. Now, he doesn't personally do this. He, you know, sends a basketball off to one of these companies that bronzes baby shoes and they since they have the foundry and the technology and just basically commissions for them to create a bronze version of a basketball that he puts on display. And in fact, that's true for a lot of Coons's work. He comes up with the idea but he doesn't execute it. He usually has um other people who are technicians in these various media uh, execute his work for him because of course he is the idea guy another thing that Coons does in the 80s that's very connected to the postmodern idea is that he um, does a series um, the banality series is a series of sculptures where he commissions um, companies that create stuff like the Franklin Mint to do um, to do these objects for him. So here is a painted wood sculpture, uh, fairly large, a couple of feet, you know, so it's fairly substantial um, wood sculpture. This is the sort of um, mascot of his banality series. Um, something that's banal is something that is, you know, dumb, everyday, commonplace, kind of cheesy or kitschy. Uh, and that's what he's got here, ushering in banality. He's got two little angels on either side that look like, I mean, this is kind of like something you might expect to see in, you know, a grandma's collectible case next to the Hummel figurines. But it's a twist on that because you've got these things you don't expect to see. Like there's a kid in a 1980s tracksuit helping to push the pig forward and these two little angels. Uh, it's a pig dressed up with a, a ribbon around its neck. You know, the idea of the kind of crass, um, lowbrow stuff that's being dressed up and made into art. So this is um, part of the part of the postmodern approach to making art is to embrace all of art history, to embrace both you know kind of the crappy, kitschy stuff of everyday life as well as the, the sort of high-minded stuff of modernism and put them all together. Um, so let me show you probably the most famous figure from his ushering in banality uh, series. Oh, sorry, there's another view. So you can see the other angel on the other side. And then a better view of that kid in his 80s tracksuit. This is probably the most famous. Uh, this is a sculpture that's actually about three feet tall. It's a large, uh, in this case, it's a plaster sculpture that's been painted and in, um, gilded. This is his Michael Jackson and Bubbles. Uh, famously, you know, by the 80s, I mean, Michael Jackson had become the best-selling recording artist of all time, but he had already started to exhibit some strange behavior. So he has this pet chimpanzee named Bubbles. And here, Jeff Koons has turned him into the subject of a large-scale sculpture, which actually is referencing classical art in the classical tradition. That pose is one that we would have expect to see from a figure on a Greek temple, a pediment sculpture. You know how they, in the corners of pediments, you often have these seated figures that can fit under the, um, the sloping of the, the 
roof of the pediment. So here you've got that kind of style and you've got that kind of um, um, medium, but then the subject is not a, a Greek god or a dying Gaul or something like that. It's Michael Jackson, right? So this is the banality series. It's this postmodern approach to making art. And here again, this would be something that he did not actually create himself. He would have commissioned a company or a workshop to do this for him. The polychromy here, the multicolored painting here with the gilding on it is actually probably historically accurate to how Greek sculptures in the ancient period would have originally been painted. So just uh, an interesting side note there. This sculpture, by the way, sold a couple of years ago for about, I think it was about $10 million. So it has become a classic from the 1980s. And again, Coons is one of the most expensive living artists out there. He's often setting record-breaking uh, record prices, and um, in this case, no exception. Another of his series by uh, the 1980s, this is a stainless steel version of a Rococo sculpture. So he had an um, 18th century portrait bust of a woman that he commissioned a company to create a stainless steel reproduction of. So just, and again, very typical of postmodernism, taking historical works of art and reworking them, putting them into other media. Um, uh, in this case, this woman was a famous adulteress, I believe, whose story was well known in Italy. So he's taken that and turned it into this, um, turned it into this sculpture, um, working with the history of art, um, not necessarily doing this himself. You know, I just think if abstract expressionism is the kind of poster child for modernism, with those guys, it was all about the touch of the artist and the expression of the artist. And with a postmodern artist, that's not it at all. You know, Jeff Koons doesn't care if he ever personally touches this sculpture. It's the idea that he's created that he um, wants, that is important. And it is this... Um, irreverence of tradition that is important to him. Uh, this is just an example of, uh, this should say 18th century. Well, no, that is a 17th century bust. Um, but this idea of these kind of um, um, portrait busts that you could find with the real curly hair uh, that he's taking and, and using in his uh, recreation. Here's another of his series, or his banality series of the 1980s. This is actually a portrait sculpture of his then wife, whose name was, um, uh, well, her nickname is La Cicalina. She was a porn star, an Italian porn star, who became a member of parliament in, in the Italian parliament in the 80s and uh, married Jeff Koons. And while they were married, he um, did a whole series of works that were about her and a series of works that were about them and their sex life together. Um, so this is from his uh, his banality series in the 80s. It's her holding a stuffed animal of the Pink Panther. It's very representational. It's very kind of kitschy. Um, it's very typical of his 80s work. Here, oh, and I should mention, I'm going to have a couple of, they're actually rather tame from this series, the, um, the Jeff Koons Made in Heaven series, but they're a little bit explicit, so just a warning for you. Um, here, is Jeff Koons uh, with his wife at the time, La Chicalina. They're dressed, uh, or they're they're um, referencing the idea of um, traditional works of art, but here then, of course, including a more sort of soft, in this case, softcore porn um, aesthetic. All right, so mixing high and low, sacred and profane, uh, and very much part of this postmodern attitude to making art. He also does not only large-scale photographs of the two of them in various positions, but this is uh, the two of them actually engaged in coitus. Um, from a photograph, he has a large-scale sculpture made uh, of the two of them engaged in sex. And then he also has these glass figurines made of the two of them from this uh, Made in Heaven series. So it's, again, you know, it's taking the low and the high, the sacred and the profane, the dirty and the exalted, and mixing them all together. Also doing, um, commissioning versions of these sculptures that are in what are traditionally considered kind of, you know, kitsch media, like this glass uh, figurine type of thing that you would expect to find in somebody's curio cabinet. Uh, these are all typical of Coons in the 80s and the early 90s. 
He also becomes famous for doing this kind of um, series of sculptures where he's taken essentially what would be a, an inflatable toy, right? A balloon animal of a bunny. Um, very non-serious, very playful and childlike image, and he's had it cast in, st in stainless steel. So this would be, you know, if you went up to it, it looks sort of like it might be a mylar balloon, but it's actually a heavy, weighty stainless steel sculpture. Um, and again, so playing with, playing with jokey, um, playful, kind of friendly, um, unpretentious, lowbrow imagery. Uh, Kuhn's also in the 90s did a series of large-scale topiary sculptures, uh, that is, you know, these big wire constructions. Um, there's one in front of the Guggenheim Museum in Bilbao, Spain. It's called Puppy, and it's a big, giant, like about a, a two-story tall building size uh, wire sculpture that's covered in flowers, and it's shaped like a puppy, you know, so non-traditional medium. Um, and very playful, which is again typical of Kuhn's and then typical of this postmodern trend that emerges in the 80s. Uh, despite these things being very jokey and playful and whatnot and uh, childlike even, they are really, again, you know, very expensive, very um, the sort of top of the um, art market, you know, collectibles. Here's a, something he's done more recently, a series of 100 inflatable hulks in the Lever House Gallery in 2001. The Lever House itself is actually an icon of modernism, so it's funny to have these postmodernist artists displaying in there. And uh, let's see, Chain Link in Santa Monica. So here he's got these uh, you know, inflatable water toys. It's this area that's real close to the beach in Santa Monica, so appropriate to the area of uh, these balloon animals that have gotten, or balloon inflatable bat, or um, pool toys that have gotten stuck on this chain link fence. He's also become uh, the darling of uh, some of the major art collectors in the world. This is actually, let's see, the Palazzo Grassi is owned by the guy that owns um, the company that, that makes Louis Vuitton luggage. Um, I think it's called FBM Group. Very, very um, wealthy art collector. So here's his giant kind of candy heart hanging in the Palazzo Grassi in Venice. A recent sculpture, I think this is from 2006. Um, so he's continued in this mode where he makes these kind of pop culture images that are in unexpected media or very large scale uh, and, and, and uh, very accessible, very understandable, you know, not, um, not the formal kind of cold, uh, and, and abstract minimalism, but something kind of playful and, and understandable. And here's another example, again, from the same collector. This is uh, floating on a little pier uh, in Venice, uh, his balloon dog Magenta, which is a very large scale stainless steel version of a balloon dog animal, a child's toy. Uh, again, so very much this postmodern playful approach to making art not so serious not so concerned with you know the thing itself but with uh, making something that's fun and and um, playful and understandable uh, very much part of this whole postmodern trend so again I mean Jeff Koons you can classify him as neo dada for the purposes of the exam and uh, hope you get a sense of how he's also the exemplar of postmodernism. He continues to work, he continues to sell, he continues to show. Uh, he, by the way, he and La Chica Lina ended up getting divorced, and one of the things that he said, um, and he had, he had a son with La Chica Lina and ended up getting custody, and you know, in that whole painful process of divorce and custody arrangements and whatnot, he said he wants his art especially after he'd gone through this very painful experience, he really wants his art to be something that people can just enjoy, that it adds joy to people's lives. So, I mean, you can love a guy like Coons or hate him. I hope you understand sort of what it is that a guy like a guy like Coons is doing. And I think it's interesting that one of the things he says is not only does he want to make a lot of money, which is certainly something he said early on, but also that he wants to bring... Uh, enjoyment and joy to people and he does he likes to do art that's human and that's relatable and that people can love um, that doesn't require you to go through some sort of you know training to understand unlike I would say Donald Judd's, Judd's minimalism for example
Oh, and here's just another example. Uh, this is from the Lever House show. So here, you know, a purchased um, ladder from a hardware store with this Caterpillar um, inflatable toy stuck in it. So, you know, jokey and understandable and relatable.